I like playing a character. I like playing the bad guy. I like playing the a And when you strip that away, then you're just you and you, have, you still have to address the elephant in the room. This week on Between You and Me, I sit down with comedian and host Jordan Klepper, who got his big break in 2014 as the out of touch white guy correspondent on The Daily Show. He landed his own Comedy Central series called The Opposition in 2017, playing a right-wing conspiracy theorist covering the absurdities of the daily news cycle. But the show received mixed reviews and was cancelled after one season. Now Jordan is back with Klepper, a documentary series that takes him out from behind a desk and onto the front lines with activists, highlighting issues like fracking, indigenous rights and DACA. Good. Okay, amazing. More speeding. Love. So congrats. I'll take it, this thank so you. Fun. Yeah, the show is really cool. We had a blast doing it. You're pretty open and upfront about the fact that like the desk is long gone. Like, why was that so important for you for, for this well, series? Well, there's a lot of shows out right, right now where there are people behind the desk telling stories often from a coast about what's happening. And so as we were building this thing out and talking to do a show that was gonna be in the field and field based, it was like, let's really push ourselves to, to not have a home base, to really go out there, put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. I was gonna say like how, because you, you are unabashed about the fact that you feel uncomfortable in a number of scenes. Mostly uncomfortable throughout this <laughs> yeah. entire series, yes. <laughs> so what, what the is that with? Did you feel that you needed to actually experience uncomfortability to be kind of a true storyteller? I think so, yes. Um, uh, an important part with this was like, why? <laughs> Why should this comedian, who I, 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 once I decided to strip away irony and just being sarcastic, which were tools I did on The Daily Show a lot, I love those tools, but I was like, I, I want to earnestly engage with these stories, but why am I out here then? Why is some comedian from Comedy Central in the middle of these stories? It was like, well, I guess I need to be, as some people have said, an avatar for the audience. Like, if I'm gonna be up close with a story about protesters or people who are taking action, I am not along for the ride for the months beforehand. I'm there for a week. And I think what quickly became relevant to why I was there was like, I need to show that it is difficult to be out there. Yeah. That's what I'm earnestly showing because I hate it out there. <laughs> How did you avoid not seeming like a parachute journalist, essentially? It's a balance. We, we, we wanted to be pretty upfront while we were there and also in the edit about like, I don't want to be seen like, these are my causes, I'm the one who is on the line, I'm the one making a difference. Like, even when I am a part of it, I think the one episode where I got arrested was the one time we really crossed over into like, okay, I will be a part of your cause, I will stand with you. We're getting arrested. Taking jam. But I want to be very clear that like, that's a luxury that I have, it's a privilege. And that was a, a theme we started to deal with as the season progressed. Like. We were really open about the types of stories we were telling. And also like, yeah, I'm a white guy who has the privilege to drop in and be a part of these stories. The notion of privilege, I think, is something that it feels like you kind of had to address head on, right? Like as a white guy in comedy, especially in a time when there are not many minority voices or people of color that get these opportunities. A hundred percent. I think like, I'm fortunate. I. Uh, I worked really hard to try to get a job on TV and I got one when I was 35 and I and I got to be a guy on TV and I got to have multiple chances, which a lot of people don't get. And a lot of guys who are white and look like me have those chances. I'm not saying I always was good at handling that, but I think like, but as a comedian, I know that's where a lot of fun can be had. Like a guy who wants to do well, a guy who's very aware of being white, aware of the foibles of being white and the foibles of attempting to save things. like. I will say as we went along there, like I, I, I stayed more on the periphery with our first few shoots. And after I continuously got approached by people saying like, you can't be on the periphery. Like you're either weaponizing your privilege or you're not. Did you start questioning your own sense of identity and your sort of professional label? Like, did you start to think to yourself, am I a comedian? Am I an activist? Like, where do I feel comfortable being? I don't see myself as an activist. I see myself as active. I think the more I'm engaged in this, the more active you get within this. I definitely come at it as a comedian. I'm very open. Like, I am not a journalist. That doesn't mean we don't take what we do at the show very seriously. The sources we are using are, are real journalists getting these stories that we're finding and we're utilizing them and putting our own spin on that. The 
your position was obviously something you were very proud of and worked hard on and it didn't necessarily land. I think people got pretty exhausted with uh, the chaotic cycle and I think there was a lot of ways in which for people to connect to it. I think there's, we were at 11.30 with a lot of really talented other shows at 11.30 who were talking about the, the news of the day, the, the tweet of the day, and the outrage of the day. There seems to be a sort of verve and zest that some people have at sure. kind of like celebrating somebody when they're down or like when they're not necessarily as high as, as they once were. How did you deal with that in a kind of public way? Well, I think of a benefit. If you don't get super high, you probably also get a, don't get torn down super low. So I maybe succeeded with that a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> I think, I mean, it's tough. I love doing the opposition. I wish it caught on and it didn't. And it's, it's hard. It's hard for something like uh, that's your baby that you craft with a hundred other people for it not to, not to go on forever. I think it was, it was heartbreaking. I, I think you, you do yourself a favor trying to block out as much of the noise outside and only listen to the people that you trust. Uh, I don't say I, I'm good at that. I think as soon as you open that in, like, yeah, people want to take you down. They want to be upset about the things that you, uh, you had and want to celebrate the failures that you've maybe stumbled upon. Um, I think, like, a thing that I benefited from is I'm, you know, I just turned 40. And as you get older, thank you. I you made still it. have hair. It's I, I can look at this. Look at the wind. Ah, I'm doing this. <laughs> a benefit though, like you care less and less about how you are perceived. When you are going through those knocks, who do you call? Do you text Trevor? Do you? I mean, like, the, the, I think there's this idea, at least from the outside, that like you guys just almost be mates. You mm -hmm. must just text Colbert or like you know <laughs> send memes to John Stewart or like. I mean, do you do you have a kind of sense of camaraderie? The Daily Show is a family, and I think that is what's so kind. I think like uh, before and after, I will reach out, and I re re uh, reached out to Sam, Sam B, to Trevor, to John. Everybody kind of gets it. I think a thing that was. What did you text him? Like, were you like, I feel really. I was like, someone like give me a beer. Do you have a writing position open on your show? Uh, let Did you me really? Know. No, <laughs> no, no. I was gonna no. say I was like, we like I will bring you your team. Well, I will say well, a thing that I remember is like uh, when the show got announced that it was, it was a weird situation. The opposition got announced as like the opposition's ending, and Jordan Klepper has a new show coming out. So it's a it was a weird day uh, when it all got announced. I remember getting Sam reached out, and Sam was a friend, and Sam was a uh, a fantastic person. And so kind and I think like reached out immediately was like that sucks also congratulations doing it once a week is awesome great and you're good in the field so congrats on what this is gonna be I remember like Seth uh, was when I was getting ready for the opposition telling me something like it, it took him almost a year and a half to feel like he knew what the show was and then maybe like another year to feel comfortable in that and I realized almost every other host had the same story. It just, it's, it's a weird race that you don't really know until you get in it. And even as somebody who was on The Daily Show for a year and a half, like I thought I knew what it was until I was in charge. And then you're like, oh no, this is a totally different race. It's weird, you get pot shots taken at you in different ways that you have to kind of roll with. And so I was lucky enough to have some of that camaraderie to get through it. And, oh my. Is it someone's Tamagotchi? I knew it. You gotta feed <laughs> that thing. Sorry, feed I, that I, that's thing. what I'm thinking. Do you feel like you would have had this trajectory if Trump had not been elected? Uh, no. I think, uh, I mean, my trajectory specifically based on uh, the fervor of uh, Trumpiness, I think, is, has been really curious over the last three years. I was covering him on the road with The Daily Show. I was satirizing the far-right voices that he often got his news from with the opposition. And now I'm running as far away as I can from him to the middle of America to cover other stories. And so part of this show is, is trying to get outside of the Trumposphere. And you can't. I mean, he's affecting everything. But you can get to other people who care about issues that he's affecting on more personal uh, on a, on a more personal level. How important was it for you, or was it important for you at all, not to talk down or be seen as kind of being pejorative towards Trump supporters? Sure. Uh, I mean, not important at all. I, right. love I love talking down to people. I talk down to people all the time. Uh, but you're tall. I mean, it helps when you're It's just the consistent. Height. Yeah, just biologically, yeah. I have to do that. <laughs> uh, we wanted with this show, everything is so gosh darn partisan right now. I think that was really important for us. Um, to not demonize To them. not just demonize, and also just to get a, get closer to three dimensions. 
you're doing most, uh, if you're doing clickbait, if you're doing four minute pieces, you're getting snapshots of what a Trump voter would look like or what a progressive will look like. When you have 22 minutes, you have a chance to extend that a little bit, and they, they think things other than the one thing you have a chance to dip in and understand. But so who is the audience for the show? Do you want to be preaching to the choir, or are you trying to challenge people on the other side of the political aisle? For me, the audience was those people who are normally turning the channel as a chance to get a little bit back in, to be like, hey, there's some political issues out there that I'm not going to scream about Trump. I'm not going to scream left or right. We're going to talk about vets. And what's surprising about vets is a lot of people can get on the same page with this. What's interesting about these stories is that these guys are actually kind of inspiring in a way you wouldn't normally see. And so I'm hoping to sort of wean people in who might be put off by the political bickering and might not normally engage in a documentary to kind of see some of these stories that wouldn't be out there. It is fascinating, like, so for example, the decoder access pipeline, which you you know talk about and which you profile, and, and the fights around mm -hmm. not just you know where it was in Dakota, but then obviously further south in the show. I mean, these were things that were going on during the Obama years, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, the decoder access pipeline isn't just a Trump thing. Yeah. So you know, why the urgent sense of action from you now, mm -hmm. as opposed to when maybe when Obama was in office? Sure. Well, I think. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's specifically opportunity. The fact that I was given a chance to be like, well, now what are we gonna do? I spent a lot of years talking about people taking action. And I think that's what a lot of comedians do, not to throw shade on everybody else, but we spend a lot of time away from stories talking about what's happening elsewhere. Well, and you I think stand like, in front of a curtain. You and stand in front of a curtain, you talk about those mm -hmm. things. And I think like we might march at marches every now and then, but but you're consistently telling stories of the Dakota Access Pipeline. I met Chinupa Hanska, and we were talking. He was wonderful, but he called me. He was like, it's great you're here. Where were you two years ago? I wasn't there, 100%. I was, I was making jokes about it. I don't re regret being progressive and making jokes that way, but I but it is true. Like a lot of these things have been going for a while. Do you think that this current landscape, political landscape, is kind of more ripe for this particular kind of activist comedy because some of these deeds and misdeeds by the administration are so out in the open? Well, I as think as opposed to hidden. A hundred percent. I think this administration is very clear about what they want to do and what they want to roll back. There's there's not much of a veneer when it talks to uh, when you talk about women's rights or abortion issues. It's very clear what's happening and what might very well happen in the next few months. I think it was a real wake up call that there are a lot of people in this country who want the country to go one direction, and a lot of people in this country want to go another direction. Get real close. Get in there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. That's awesome. Oh yeah, that's right. That yeah, that's gonna be. <laughs> Turning to twenty twenty for a second, mm -hmm. we've got like, twenty three Democratic candidates in the field at this point. Mm -hmm. Disclaimer: we may have more. Having been out in America and being in the field and like talking to all these people, mm -hmm. do you feel like there is enough? of a sway against this current administration? Like, is the tide turning? I think we are, we are fractured. Whether or not the tide is turning, I don't know if the tide needs to completely turn. I think it just, I think people need to get out and vote. 2020 is gonna be, it, it, who's guess as to who that exciting new face is going to be, or potentially old face is going to be. I think what we're not going to see is, we're not gonna see a lot of fence sitters. I think those people who decided to stay home because Trump couldn't be elected, they didn't like Hillary, I think those people will get out, and I think that's a significant uh, significant number. Even one or two percent could make or break an election. I think it's important for the Democrats to figure out who that person's speaking to, not only the base, but to get people excited. Do you worry that the left is eating itself? Do you worry that in the kind of pursuit of purity and like, you know, the perfect kind of politics, that the left is actually doing itself a disservice, or could be, given the America, you know, you've gone through all of America, or a lot of America right now for the series. There's definitely parts of the left that is going to eat other parts of the left, and that's kind of what the left likes to do, so kudos to the left. I still am optimistic about, like, uh, the progressive wing of this country, like, rallying around the ideas. I think we, we have seen some real pushback. When it, comes to, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to guns, I think there are a lot of people on the left who really fear what has happened over the last few years and I think that will uh, I think that'll bring a lot of people together. The thing that I am most frustrated about is that like it's all politics now. Everything all we're talking about is politics. We're not talking about governing. We need to get somebody in there who will govern. Who what will do you not... mean by govern though? 
would mean. I mean, like, right now, the impeachment, all we're talking about what the political effects of it is, are going to be. Right now, we're talking about the political effects of what Joe Biden talks about climate change. We need somebody to address climate change. We need somebody to address voting rights issues, address, uh, bring up gun bills. People need to get in there and govern. Their job is to govern. Their job is to impeach. Their job is to move forward. Their job is not to discuss whether or not it's the most popular thing to do. Mm. And I think it's infuriating to watch people just talk about it as a game. Well, the game is arguably how we ended up with our president. I think, I think you're right. And I think if all we get into is we just like the game of it, then it's just going to be a reality TV show and we're all going to be dead in 2050. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get beyond that. Hey! <laughs> ah. Season one um, of, of Klepper, you kind of tackled uh, like gun control, indigenous rights, like veterans rights. What do you have for season two. It sounds like a joke, but it's it comes out of reality. I would like to look at prison reform. I, you spend, a, you you had, spend 12 you were, hours. John, you were, you were there for like five hours. But, but I have cred now, you know? Oh, I, sorry, the yeah. The stories. Do you have I, a tattoo? You've got a tattoo on that. I have yeah. a tramp stamp tattoo that I got in jail. That's excellent. Uh, just because I'm a cool kid. Yeah. It does sound dumb, but it is like a little bit of exposure to that, talking to other people who were in the system. You spend, you spend six hours in a cell with somebody who is in the system getting bounced around who can't pay bail and is losing their job on the outside and going back into the system again. Like, it, it does reframe things. And so I, I would love to do an episode that looks closer at that. Would you I, do Kim K at the same time? Would like Kim K be part of it? Kim Kar Kardashian? Yeah. By all means. I think, honestly, I think it would be fascinating to look at the people who are effective. She has been remarkably effective. You know, if I could get Kim Kardashian on to talk a little bit about that, we both go to jail together. I think that's, that's, I think that's exactly what Comedy Central wants. I mean, I think what's, what's amazing about all of these things is it's finding the small stories within it. I think there's a lot of little stories out there that I would love to, to again, sink my teeth into. Mm. Thanks so much, Jordan. It's just such a pleasure. Thank what you. What a delight, yeah. Thank you for watching Between You and Me. There are plenty more episodes, so you can click here and subscribe to watch more.